Um, I'd like to hand um, the session across to Shane Hodgkins, the CEO of Matrack, who will be moderating today's panel. Um, thank you. Cool. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. That was super exciting. Um, I'll just give the others a couple of seconds to join us. Um, so today, um, so we're basically going to be talking about uh, supply chain and different sort of ways that people can work to um, essentially increase the efficiency of how it works. Um, as we're going to be discussing, um, a lot of different sort of companies and uh, industries have had some pretty sophisticated ways of keeping track of their own materials while they handle it. Um, but one of the big challenges for construction is that you tend to have dozens, if not sometimes hundreds of companies uh, working together. And so finding better ways of being able to share that information about materials up and down the chain is really how we can um, get more efficiency out of the entire build and uh, reduce everyone's stress levels. Um, so I have a pretty fantastic uh, panel joining me today. Really grateful for you guys making the time. Um, so we have uh, Malcolm Davies, who is construction director um, of facades at SRG Global. Um, he has been um, with the industry for a whopping 30 years, which you wouldn't expect uh, for how he looks. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, and has been a huge champion for innovating uh, innovation in the way that construction uh, works, um, and as you'll get to in a, a second. Um, we've got uh, Huya Edmonds from um, HD Logistics. Um, so he's had a, uh, after a 20 year professional rugby career, um, he's worked as a business uh, developer for commercial FF&E um, at Harvey Norman, um, and then has decided to look at different ways that you can uh, tackle the challenges of supply chain with um, uh, the logistics company that he's founded. Um, we have Peter Hu, who is the facade general manager at Hickory Group. Um, he has over a decade of industry knowledge and experience and um, has led a huge uh, wave of innovation from Hickory's perspective, both in terms of how they uh, work with the uh, upstream manufacturers, um, but also how they actually use those processes to um, empower sort of other um, clients that they work with, both in Australia and overseas. Um, and Ina Kabul, who is uh, Matrack's own head of growth, um, and so she has got 10 years uh, construction experience um, working across Australia, the US and the UK, um, and then has joined us about three years ago to um, help bring some of that knowledge and, and bring the industry forward from, from our side. Um, so yeah, thank you guys very, very much for your time today. Um, cool, so uh, just to kick off, um, was just interested to hear um, maybe from yourself, Malcolm, um, about how you found the construction industry when you first started, in particular for the ways that um, materials were, were managed and how that was sort of tracked and shared with other companies. Sure, uh, yeah, very labor intensive. So uh, a lot of uh, Excel spreadsheets, probably a dozen or so over the, over the life of a project, uh, all, all manually entered, uh, very cumbersome, uh, full of human errors as, as it always is. Uh, so mm. very way of going about it, um, yeah. So um, so for so diving into that a little bit. So for when you um first came into the business, so were uh, as in not uh, SRG specifically, but just when you first started in the industry, um, so were there sort of internal systems that were being used as well, or was it pretty much Excel top to bottom um back then? Pretty much Excel top to bottom, but uh, also uh, we were um, you know, maintaining you know, trips to suppliers and and getting face to face to to try and get the transparency in there. Which was definitely the hard way of going about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess Peter, for yourself with the same question, um, how did how did you find that when you began? Was it a similar sort of experience? Yeah, it's the same. It's the uh, it's a lot of yeah, like Malcolm said, it's a lot of uh, data in manual into Excel, right? A lot of Excel, different revisions and different parties filling different Excel. Because uh, if you look at the whole supply chains you start with the joints right and you grab all this drawing information and you manually data entry to the excel every single work right? you need keying and then goes to the manufacturers goes to the uh, shipping agents and goes to the yard uh who received the material where we stored all the material goes to the side goes to the install and goes to the qi so you got probably four or five different parties sharing one excel so everyone feeling their their part and they got multiple different revisions of Excel sort of over the shop. So uh, 
it's not mm. really helping. And the, the process of this uh, information data exchange, right, it's been like bad you know, back to the old days. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, so who, yeah, was it sort of similar when you, when you joined the industry in terms of just Excel being sort of the standard way to, to track and share information? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I totally agree with, uh, what Malcolm was saying, labor intensive, um, human errors. Um, we were dealing a lot with hard copies at that, at that stage. Uh, we were dealing with joinery companies, uh, from, uh, offshore. So it was hard to sort of manage. Uh, the delivery process of equipment coming from it was it was based in Sydney and then coming down to Canberra um, and getting getting basically down to Canberra and it was just everywhere so um, yeah it was a it was a complete nightmare yeah um, and for your yourself Inika as well obviously you had a bit of a different experience for some of the different um, countries that you were working in um, is this like an Australian problem or was that something that you were seeing overseas as well or yeah yeah, very similar, I'd say, to, to all three. Um, pretty consistently, I found that there was just that lack of accurate information on materials, um, particularly around critical materials like facade and services and things. Um, most projects, yeah, in, in the different countries were all still managed um, with Excel and uh, email and phone calls. Um, so definitely, I found it was quite fragmented. Um, and I guess for me, being sort of project management side, managing projects and the delivery of them, um, it just made it really difficult to, to track them and make sure that they were um, on schedule and, and to find out ahead of time if they were falling behind. Um, mm. I think also I found efficiency on site sometimes was a little bit low um, as trades often didn't know when the trade before them had finished their work to be able to start theirs. Um, so yeah, just, just a lot of, I, I guess, sort of sometimes, yeah, working not so much in the dark, but just with that lack of information, it, it slowed, um, projects down a lot. Um, and then also similarly, I had some experience, um, procuring materials direct from international suppliers. Um, and I found the language barrier, uh, and also the cultural differences, um, when I was communicating with them through emails, phone calls and spreadsheets, um, which were a bit hard to, to read because obviously I didn't speak or read their language, super difficult. Um, so without technology to help sort of remove some of these barriers, uh, it, it definitely made it more challenging to, to even procure materials direct. Yeah, 100%. So, um, uh, so I guess there was like quite a few different sort of issues that you guys um, touched on as part of that. Um, one of the ones that you mentioned was kind of that risk and sort of impact of, of human error, obviously, as, as you made it mentioned, Peter, if you've got four or five different companies trying to update the same spreadsheet, then, you know, you're definitely going to get those sort of issues. Um, I was wondering if yourself or, or some of the others, whether it's at previous companies rather than your current companies, um, have sort of seen what can actually happen, what sort of impact it makes for the actual job site and the build um, when you do end up with these sort of human errors? Well, um, well, so that comes to uh, the uh, the digital tracking tools, right, to help us. How can we sort of make sure everyone on the same page and have a, a digital sort of a cloud based platform to resolve that problem, right? So. Mm. Uh, so with the well, what we currently use is Azure, of course, and the um, uh, it's basically every party, all the different parties, four or five different parties, put their information with their updates, progress, and the production status or installation status on one platform, right? It's cloud basis. Everyone got access to that particular platform, so we share the same information, get rid of all these uh, uh, different versions or different revisions of the Excel spreadsheet which helps a lot as first second is when malcolm saying okay human error data entries so with a digital platform so which we can use the, uh, the sort of qr code or barcode sort of you can scanning on the panel on the material that's automatically updated on the cloud so that helps a lot mm -hmm. on reduce a lot of these human errors of like you tell the boys grab a pen and paper and go and note all the numbers what they have done and then come back and sort of update the excel spreadsheet that that's like really uh will save a lot of time on uh, using this qr code and the uh, what else uh i think that's probably the two most important things yeah 100 percent. yeah no i really appreciate that that's uh 
that's awesome. Um, awesome to hear. So I guess um, for for yourself, uh, Malcolm, have you seen sort of projects where because of some of the human error sort of issues when you're not using QR codes for an instance, like what that means in terms of the actual build site, how, how that's gone? Yeah, sure. Um, so being able to have that uh, that, that cloud-based update, that dashboard uh, for us is is absolutely paramount with with transparency mm -hmm. to, our, to our clients. Makes makes a big difference in, into what uh, everyone's seeing the real time aspect. So the only way that they can work well and have that transparency is is for that information to be accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you bring that data manually into that cloud-based system, uh, you're going to have those errors. So and we've seen that before in, in previous in previous projects. Uh, where you think perhaps your shipment's on the way and it hasn't actually even left yet, or uh, you mm. know, your delivery to site is supposed to supposed to be today uh, and it should be on site, but uh, you know you go and check the next day and it's not there um, because it didn't come. So with with the the matra process of scanning and and bringing that uh, information live, you can check and make sure that 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 inf you know that product has been delivered. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. Um, so I think um, one of the reasons that we're really keen to have uh, all, all of you guys uh, as part of this panel is because of the fact that you've been really pushing boundaries of what um, has been kind of the industry standard in, in quite a way. Um, uh, so Malcolm, as an example, um, so obviously even before you guys met us, um, all of you were sort of really promoting new ways to do things in the industry. Um, with uh, SRG specifically, um, you guys went to the uh, pretty, rare and honestly pretty fantastic step of actually developing a, a full system to be able to keep track of um, some of the, the all of the materials that you're working on so that you could solve some of these industry-wide problems. Um, can you tell me a bit about what led you guys to saying enough is enough and actually deciding to build your own system in that first place? Uh, sure, uh, just going back to efficiency. So we started with uh, looking towards an ITP uh, online platform so that we could uh, you know, track the installation progress on site uh, and, and the various steps along the way and the whole points and then referring that information back to, to our clients. Um, and through the process of building that app, uh, we, yeah, even with the help of our IT department, uh, we found that very difficult. Uh, and what actually ended up happening was we were spending more time trying to input that data into the system uh, and to get the reports to come out of it. So there was more input uh, and less output. Uh, which, mm. which doesn't work for any business. So uh, that's when we turned around and said, how can we make this better? What can we do? Uh, and the short answer was, we can't do it ourselves. <laughs> that's when we went out to the and, uh, yeah. and started looking around and, and that's when I, I came across you guys and we had our, our first meeting. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I think, uh, Peter, you guys obviously did a, a similar sort of thing. You guys were already looking at a lot of different sort of tooling um, from sort of even other industry sectors um, to be able to get better ways of sort of getting that supply chain visibility. What what made this a big priority for Hickory? Yeah, so uh, yeah, we back probably like four or five years ago, we started looking at what software can we use, right, to minimize these human errors and trying to get all the data on one cloud-based platform. So uh, we went down that path with a, a company in Hong Kong called the Juno. We went there a few times trying to set the set up the system because uh, that system, that particular system, is mainly for tracking like uh, import goods, like uh, shoes, like uh, clothes, like all that kind of stuff. It's a bit different from what we really need it, right? So uh, went down that path, but we find out the uh, what they can do is uh, we still need to give them the Excel for them to sort of suck all the information from Excel and put on the system, right? So to create the Excel, mm -hmm. still uh, they still cannot get rid of the Excel, right? As a start. So that didn't really end well, and that, that particular system got its restraints. It's not really can be customized to an extent, right? So we sort of when we turn around, come back, right, say, okay, what software can we use? And then as uh, as metric come on board, and we sort of look, start looking, start talking about it. So what metric got helped us on the as uh, this particular hard software? It can really suck all the information from the join, okay, directly to the system, rather than we, as what we did before, right, grab all this information and manually key it in into Excel. So that get rid of all this hard work. The system can do that automatically, which helps a lot and really, really well, make our life a lot easier. That's why we, um, we like it. 
Yeah, I appreciate that, man. That's awesome. Um, who, yeah, for, for even for yourself, um, when you first started uh, your own business, you intentionally tried to set things up so that you would run it quite differently to what other logistics um, providers had done. And in particular, looking at ways that you can um, almost take on some of the responsibilities that's outside of traditional sort of logistics companies in terms of how you can um, essentially optimize for the site efficiency and sort of take more of that on yourself. Um, what sort of led you to wanting to do things differently in the first place? Well, I guess uh, I guess it all started when we were we were heading up the joinery sector for Harvey Norman Commercial, um, and we were getting a supply chain of joinery out of Sydney uh, that was coming from offshore, uh, and I think the lack of transparency with the builders, the joiners, the sparkies, and everyone else um, to exactly what Malcolm said to, to being on site and, and Inica to getting product from the supplier to getting it down to the building uh, or the development that we were delivering it to and making sure that the joiners were on on par with what we were what we were delivering also. Um, mm -hmm. and product was coming in and we didn't even know that it was coming in at the same time. So um basically basically the builders were getting upset with it the joiners were getting upset with it we didn't know what was going on we were going back to the suppliers going what what's what's going on here um and it was just a complete nightmare and, and i think that's how it all started from there um and uh there's a builder down here called block and i think Inica introduced me um oh they introduced me to Inica actually um and that's how it all started with matrack and i think we we had probably a, one or two hours together and I actually thought this is a really great idea and a, and a great system um, moving forward with with joinery and we still do it with joinery um, but I thought there's an there, there's another part of the industry that we work with with Harvey's and that's appliances too to the multi-res uh, and the commercial sites um, and that was a complete nightmare in itself too um, so as as Nathan said Nathan Kircher from Lang O'Rourke he said, we got to make life, we, we got to make our uh, work a lot easier. Um, and, and the way that they were doing it uh, previously was not easy and it was not good uh, when it was coming to site. It was sitting down the basement. Uh, it was sitting there for months and months and product was getting stolen and damaged. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I came up with a structure or a sort of business idea of how we can eliminate triple handling of product from truck to truck to warehouse to warehouse. Um, and taking it to site, leaving it on site. Um, and it's sort of come down to, okay, let's get a system together. Let's get my warehousing together. Obviously I've got trucks and transport, sort of, we, we try to sort of integrate it all into one. Um, so the only, the only problem that you would have if there was a problem would come back directly to me and not go through that party or the, the party before that or the party before that. So um we're, we're sort of getting we're, we're just new to this uh we're probably six or seven months into it uh, but we're getting really good headway uh with matrack and the way that we're sort of um scanning uh or tracking all of our product which is about fourteen thousand products per development um and we're getting really good headway with the builder and developer uh, and they can see the benefits of it because there's a lack of there's a lack of damage, there's a lack of stolen goods, um, and uh, it, it's all going to site uh, in one piece. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's, it seems like a really, um, it's kind of like the industry has kind of gotten to the point now where they've, they've really said, yeah, enough is enough in a lot of these different ways and actually taking on those sort of improvements now in a way that probably, yeah, 10 or 20 years ago, people just thought were maybe just too hard, I guess. Um, so that's awesome. Well, I guess I guess it's just making life easier for for the builder. They, they've got enough stress um, on a on a construction site as it is, and I think uh, if you get a if you get a a thousand dollar mixer that goes that goes missing, and you get five or six of those go missing a, a day, then it, it causes them a lot more stress. But if we can yeah. if we can sort of hold it um, on or in our warehousing uh, and then take it to site when needed, uh, it all gets we're just looking at QR coding now for, for pallets and rooms um, with Matrack at the moment. So uh, that's just another mm. benefit that you guys offer us also. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, 
with uh, yourself, Inika, obviously a lot of your um, previous experience was looking at things from the client side as well. Um, in terms of what Huyu was just saying about how, you know, obviously they find it better if, if they know where, where materials are and knowing that things are actually heading to schedule. Um, what was that sort of perspective from that you had previously? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, just being able to get that visibility um, and to know that the supply chain is somewhat connected by having this technology where they can share information um, that they need to share anyway. Uh, and instead of working sort of more in silos, they're able to work cross-functionally across different different teams um, and across the different gates of the supply chain. I mean, ultimately for, for us on sort of more the project management side, it really helps us to de-risk projects, um, but also to work proactively when we can see something, you know, arises that's an issue, we can shuffle things around on site to be able to manage or to, to mitigate that, um, the impact that has on site. Whereas, yeah, working, you know, without this technology, it's much harder for us to work proactively. So I think just, yeah, to, to de-risk in particular and to ultimately have more control um, over delivering projects. But at the end of the day, it also helps all of the stakeholders because they're sharing information. So there's less work, more efficiencies for them. And yeah, as Huya said, it, it helps a lot um, for each of the parties. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so for yourself, Peter, in terms of sort of uh, Hickory's clients and when you're able to sort of speak to them about that ability to be sort of sharing more of this sort of transparency, um, how have the, the clients normally sort of responded to that? Oh, they love it. They love it, to be honest. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, it's, it's not only the uh, the client, client is one part of the product, right? So we got a, we got a side team, we got a yard, we got a suppliers, we got installers, and we got developers, we got like the older party getting involved, right? To, when they want to see, they want to have visibility of where the product they pay for, where is it, and the history of making this product, when does this product get made, when does this product get procured, and when it's going to ship over. So on the system, right, so if you click on the system, it gives you the whole history of this product, of this particular product. If we say one facade panel, it really tells you when it's getting made, when it's getting like shipped over. If that's a defective material, which like, everyone has defective material, uh, it got a lot of tracking. So when it, at, when it has been identified as a defective, when it's rectified. So we, like, we keep the old visibility of all our like products, and we show to our client, which is a developer, okay? So yeah. we do have a how many panel which is defective and what do we do about it? And this is all the logs. So we we got all the histories. So that's, they really love it. So we're open book to every party. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah, fantastic. That, that open book uh, approach is, is really the, the, the fundamental sort of benefit of the system. Uh, we've seen that with our clients as well. That the, the the fact that we you know we we have that transparency and it it creates trust uh, and that that's key with relationships with clients. Uh, if they don't have trust, then you know we're off off to a bad start. So <laughs> we're not hiding. Everything's transparent. Everything's out in the open, uh, and that's, yeah. that's that's value add to our our proposals and our tenders. And it's yeah. definitely something across as well. Is that actually? I mean, this is maybe for everyone, but is that something that um uh that does seem to stand out like when you're when you're going and sort of uh speaking to a potential client and sort of talking about things um do they kind of expect that a lot of companies are going to want to hide things so that they can sort of sweep it more under the rug or is it is it something that you're seeing a lot of more, more so in, in years gone by uh <laughs> less scrupulous companies out there that we're, we're definitely hiding things um, I think everyone, uh, you know, will try and save face if, if they can, and, and you know, try and mitigate their own issues in their own way. Um, but in the end, uh, the transparency is is uh, received well uh, from, mm. from the client. They definitely want that. They, they prefer that than you, you battling in the background and, and trying to get there at the end of the day and, and missing the mark. So, uh, and and you know, the bad news comes at the end when, the, when there's nothing that can be done about it. So being upfront mm -hmm. and the program around those those issues uh, is definitely a, a, a good process for everybody. Yeah, fantastic. Um, cool. And I guess um, just so we've got a bit of time for sort of questions and stuff at the end. Um, uh, probably just to wrap up, what do you guys think that um, 
that the industry is going to be like sort of in, in 15 years based on sort of how we had spreadsheets being the norm for, you know, the last three decades. And now a lot of people are like you guys in particular are all looking at different ways that you can bring the industry forward. What do you think that's going to lead to? Uh, for myself. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Uh, I, I jump in. Um, to my mind, we lead more towards the electronic side of things. Uh, maybe RFID or some similar uh, chip fashion like that, uh, where you can you can track it and uh, maybe it's a reusable or, or de degradable uh, product. Uh, it, to my mind, that's, that's not there yet, and it's, it's probably still a fair way off because of uh, it costs. Um, but uh, you know, design life uh, project warranties. I mean, we're, we're talking about 50 years here, and, and most of the people in this in this webinar won't won't be around. So uh, it'd be. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, something where the where the information is stored in the product, uh, perhaps as a as a long term ambition, where you could have a, a mm. chip end or something like that, and uh, and and you could have all the information from when it was made fifty years ago. Yeah, that's actually mega. And to be honest, that's even something that you guys are looking to start doing today with some of what you've been doing actually already. So um, you're kind of bringing that future to life very very quickly. Trying. <laughs> we've got the idea. <laughs> Again, but we don't, we, uh, we need others to, to help us make it happen. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, no, I just sorry. wrote a note to buy shares in the SRG. <laughs> <laughs> More than welcome. <laughs> um, what about for yourself, Sam, or, or Inika, I guess, in particular, like a, sort of what do you see it's sort of heading? Uh, I think definitely around um, a lot more automation, um, as the guys have called out, I think human error often, as simple as it is, can cause such huge issues. Um, so a lot more automation. Uh, and and I think also probably, well, definitely um, data-driven decisions. Um, so I guess optimising the way that we build you know, from today, if we're looking 15 years ahead, I think we'll be building in a really different way. Um, and I, we've seen a little bit with COVID, but I imagine that we'll also be um, thinking a lot more around who's who's occupying these buildings and these spaces and making sure that, you know, that, that the way that we build is kind of um, thinking about the whole, whole life cycle and what we do at the end of that. So very much around sustainability and make sure that we're building in a sustainable way. Um, so yeah, I think um, there'll be a lot more um, data for us to make these decisions. Whereas in the past, doing everything with sort of Excel or manual processes doesn't give us that edge to be able to analyze back across data mm. and be able to then make some some decisions moving forward and, and in the future. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, of I course, think... robots and things like that. I'm sure, but. <laughs> I think I think with uh, the way that we're working at the moment, I think if we look back another uh, if we look back 15 years ago, they're still doing the same things that they're doing today, uh, and sort of no one sort of no one sort of clicked onto it as of yet, um, and the, the amount of damage and lost product that you get in the in the appliance sector um, in the multi res is is phenomenal. I think one company spent probably 70 grand extra on on damage and lost goods. Um, in just one development, so uh, we're just trying to, and, and I think I think with the system that we're we're, we're using now uh, with Matrack, it sort of it, it sort of minimises all of that, and that's sort of just moving. I guess that's moving into the next step of of what we're trying to do as a company and try to minimise every sort of risk that we can um, for the builder and also for the developer. I I, I don't know. I, hopefully hopefully we can move forward. Uh, from the last 15 years, um, maybe we have this discussion in another 15 years and see where we get to. But uh, for the time mm. being, with us and, and what we're trying to do is we, we're taking it sort of day by day and, and step by step, and we're sort of getting there to what we what we want to do. Um, and uh, I guess with with your with the help that you've given us also is is fantastic and on on and part of to be part of our company. Mm. Uh, what about your yourself, Peter, in terms of where you guys are heading and in, in that sort of period? Well, the way we see it is uh, in 
the next 15 years are right, this is the beam right the beam building model will be getting more and more popular they put more uh information in the beam modeling and the beam modeling will be will be more towards the not only from the design but more towards the construction phase and the manufacture phase right which mm. related to what we see that is more prefabrication work will be happening you know, around the whole world on the construction mm. prefab manufacture like a bathroom like facade of course we pre-manufacture all the windows and the slabs and the, all the rest of them right and balconies mm -hmm. maybe and the uh and which when we talk about prefabrication you're talking about factory you're talking about materials you're talking about trackings you're talking about the visibilities of where it is what stage it is right so as as the prefabrication is a bit modern and it's tracking of material digital tools that will be like popular in the next 15 years will be everyone talking about this yeah 100 percent. we've actually um got some uh questions coming up that relate to that as well so that'll be a good one for us to dive into uh in a second too um so i think um We've got a number of sort of questions that have come up from the audience. Um, just before we jump into that, uh, we also have a a poll question uh, that I think will be coming up on the screen in a second. Cool. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, for anyone that's sort of interested in sort of learning a bit more about uh, the the tracking system that we've been providing and sort of you know trying to help. Uh, companies that are already doing pretty amazing stuff to uh, have the tools to even do more amazing stuff, um, then just let us know if you'd be interested to chat and someone from our, our team will reach out to you. Um, cool, so I think uh, following that, um, we can go to some of the, the questions that we've got from the audience. Um, I'm just bringing them up now. So, Sorry. Um, so one of the the first ones that came up. So uh, I'm not sure if all of you guys will be across this, but um, there was recently a, um, a meat supplier that got hit with a uh, a virus in the U.S. Um, that's meant that they, um, well, basically like a ransomware virus that meant that um, all of their internal tools and systems and documents and everything were uh, locked up, and they had to either pay a ransom or they wouldn't have access to their own um, data and documents and things. Um, the questioner was asking, based on that um, recent JBS Meets debacle, um, what cybersecurity challenges does the panel see for the industry? And is a fragmented system um, actually preferable to a singular large system? Um, I don't know if you guys have some, some thoughts on, on how that sort of security of your own data around sort of materials and things uh, plays into your operations. Well, for first IG, we have our own internal service uh, and, and storage uh, of data. Uh, as far as the, the macro system goes, uh, we, we uh, you know, we, we're, we're exporting uh, reports as, as required, uh, and we've got the live login to, to the dashboard and, and access that way. So uh, for us, the security uh, internally, we're, we're quite comfortable. Um, having said, I'm not an IT expert, but... Um, <laughs> Mad track, uh, look at you know that's that's with you, with you guys obviously, but um, I see it as quite a safe platform. I mean, you, you're logging in, you, you're viewing your dashboard uh, from a client's perspective. It, it really shouldn't be too much of a risk. I, I would have thought. Mm. Yeah, I um I can't see your faces unfortunately with the uh, with the poll up at the moment, but um I I don't know uh, Peter who you're or Inika if you guys also had any sort of thoughts on, on that. Well, I guess if the uh, if the if the our current system, which is Mantra, can give us like progressively report, which is in details progressively, and where we can have a, a our own storage of all this data information, I don't see that much at risk. Is the uh, as my like as our factory will have their own record apart from Mantra, they will have their own record. Yard will have their own stock record, and the site will have their own. So. Uh, Metric is a shared cloud platform, which is good for visibility, but every party still got their own books, right? So they do their own things. And if Metric can provide, that this platform can provide us a detailed report attached with whatever information that us, and we store it somewhere in our like in-house, it'll be no problem. I don't see any major problems. Mm. 
Yeah, hundred percent. It actually makes me think it's slightly off topic, but um, because uh, one of the things that I've obviously seen a lot, and all of you guys will be very experienced with too, is um, you know, it's it's one thing to disparage Excel, but the reality is that a lot of people can do some pretty amazing sort of reporting um, and manage sort of the way that they work with those sort of tools. Um, but but probably the biggest challenge for that is that you know it's only your own document, or you you know you often only you can't sort of fully share all of that sort of stuff by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but then what, what I think a lot of companies like your, yourselves are able to do is sort of pull this data from other companies and then still get the benefit of your own internal reporting. It's just that you're actually yes. getting that information from, from the other companies as well. Correct. I think maybe as a question sort of on that note, like um, do you guys think that there's always going to be um, those sort of secret source uh, sort of tools and reportings and, and things that you guys do use internally that you would you'd want to keep internally, even if you've got some data coming from a, a sort of a shared network system? Yeah, I think there's always going to be, you know, internal reporting uh, for, for, for a larger company for sure. So the reports coming out of Matt Tracker are always, always uh, good to include into those you know, project reports that I'll, I'll put up the line each month. Um, so they're really good for that. Um, whether, you know, say a widget supplier needs to needs to have those reports secondary to the system is, is you know, probably a question for them. But um, mm -hmm. for our perspective, the, the, the Matt Track is, is the, is the uh, combined uh, online access and then, and then we have our internal reporting separately. Yeah, fantastic. Um, cool. I'll go on to the um, the next question. If if anyone else in the chat does have any sort of questions, obviously feel free to jump in. Um, so this is sort of a, a BIM related question. So um, if people are modeling correctly to LOD 450 plus with embedded data, um, assemble and Autodesk asset modules can be utilized. Um, garbage in, garbage out need to have one source for information, how can this be solved? Um, so there's probably a couple of things in that. So maybe just to begin with, um, obviously as you mentioned sort of uh, Peter, longer term, like uh, obviously as more and more information is added into the, the BIM bowl at the start of construction, um, that can be then utilized to benefit, um, you know, all of the stakeholders along the supply chain. Um, one of the big challenges actually in ICA, which you're pretty familiar with from the UK's perspective is that even though you've got hyper detailed BIM models to an extent that we don't really have in Australia, in fact, maybe I'll let you answer this. What are some of the challenges that they've had on site despite having some of those really um, detailed uh, BIM models from the, the design perspective? In particular, like for, for different subcontractors working together. Yeah, I think um, from the experience that I've had so far when we've been speaking with uh, customers in the UK is that the, subcon the BIM is not set up for the subcontractors to be using, at least at the moment. Um, and so BIM's been used heavily from that design phase and you know pre-construction, but then once it gets into construction with shop drawings and moving into fabrication, the BIM model is not really updated because the subcontractors don't have access or, or the weight of the program is so heavy and, and it's really difficult for them to update uh, into the BIM model. So I think having a tool that is much more simple for the contractors to use and, um, and a simple tool just with the information that they need to be updating um, would really help for the BIM to, to be fully utilised. Mm. Um, that kind of answers the question, but yeah. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. What about uh, who? I'd love to sort of hear your perspective in, in your role in terms of how information in BIM at the moment, or even in the the short term, would you see sort of working from that logistics perspective and sort of site efficiency perspective? Yeah, we're just we're uh, oh, yeah, sorry. We're just, uh, sorry that. Oh, you go. Oh, was that Peter? Oh, no. <laughs> sure, you're asking me, or are you asking? You go, Peter. Uh, is that, I was asking who you, but you can go as well, man. That's all, all right. good. <laughs> yeah, Am go for it, Pete. It's all good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whoever. <laughs> I get. I guess. Yeah, so I we guess. Look at, if you yeah. look at uh, to sort of use BIM, right, for some of our project before. So there's a few difficulties of really uh, implementing 
our job site or to the manufacturer. So the uh, the beam mm -hmm. modeling is is good for like sort of clash detections and all the rest of it. You look at it spinning the model, you look at the ge geometry of the buildings and how this looks like, how this connection back to the slab, how it's like connect back to the mechanical and everything, which is good, right? <clears throat> but but the uh, we, if we want to get to beam to work really with the manufacturer somehow, it's uh, in the in the factory condition, right? It's the, the, the labor still using the 2D drawings. It's still like mm -hmm. print out and papers. It's still print out less like, CAD drawings and going to the production line trying to find all the dimensions. So the beam really, uh, the model is beautiful, but it comes down to all the beam parts and get it to get the CNC to read all these files. As there's a gap there, so we 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 did a bit of study of which CNC machines can read that model, can grab all this information. But not many CNCs in China can do that kind of mm. work, right? So that's one gap. The second gap is uh, when the material gets on site, really, <clears throat> the installers they need to grab paper. Not every installer they got a like iPad or a super duty computer. They can spin around the models and find where. Where is this bracket? Where this this sub seal was or sub frame? Mm. Right? They still rely on the, the on a very old traditional way. Print out all the joints, print out all the layout joints, and they they do their work, right? So this is probably two major gaps I see why this beam mm. model has to be really implemented for the whole supply chain and the construction phase. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, we're sort it, of, it's actually we're sort of in the same model as what as what Peter was saying too. Like we're we work a lot with the uh, the joiners and the sparkies, and that, as as Peter was saying, they still they still work off the the, the drawings on on a on a on a um, on a hard copy. So um, mm. I, I guess for us, it, it, it's it, it's good, it's good, but I, I think if that if that sort of model changes, then it's just kind of make it a little bit easier, I guess, to track everything. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 pretty. In Interesting as well. I think um, there's well, your point actually Pete, about the CNC machine stuff is really interesting. Um, we uh, are obviously doing uh, have some stuff with data services which we're doing with with Hickory, but with a, a few other companies as well to be able to use the data from the supply chain and then you can plug it to whatever tool you want. Um, obviously, okay. BIM is one of them, which which we've done a bit of and are doing more of, which is great. Um, but one really interesting one is around some of the uh, manufacturing uh, machines that are used by different trades. And I, all of you guys are going to have quite a bit of experience with this. Um, when you look at sort of a, a lot of the joinery uh, factories in particular, but some of the facade factories as well in, in China, um, their systems are hyper, hyper automated and using this amazing uh, tooling uh, based on some of the stuff that's coming out of either their own 3D models or, or the ones that are originally supplied by the architects. Um, but part of the challenge is that those sort of uh, systems that they've got, which are really, really robust and not necessarily able to connect or actually share information to other parties in the supply chain. Um, all of you guys will have experienced and sort of had to sort of work through some of those challenges that the tooling's amazing, but you also want that connectivity. H how have you guys, um, like what what are some of your experiences on this front um yourselves um maybe uh i mean even inica i know some of the the factories and stuff that that we've visited there before <laughs> lockdown um and some of the companies you've worked with yeah um sorry shane what was the question sorry it was a bit waffly it was sort of around how um uh, I mean, similarly to integrating sort of supply chain data into BIM models is, is really powerful. Um, but there's also sort of a similar piece around, um, as sort of Peter was mentioning, you can have these extremely sophisticated uh, machinery and robotics and stuff that's used in some factories, not all obviously, um, but being able to have that, track that information in a way that could provide more visibility for other stakeholders would be, um, you know, is, is something that's not fully there yet. Um, so I guess I was just wondering in terms of how do you see companies or some of the companies that you've met with, how do they approach trying to connect that supply chain information with their internal processes when they might have something that's already pretty, pretty set in stone, I guess. So that was a waffly yeah, question think, as well. <laughs> yeah. um, 
I don't want to say too much about it because I'm probably not the, the best person to answer it and, and experienced enough with manufacturers. I know they do have a lot of sophisticated tools, but I think one of the biggest barriers I imagine is that their sophisticated tools are for their internal use and their company, mm -hmm. not so much for integrating with the next company uh, or stakeholder in, in the value chain. So mm -hmm. it's quite, you know, like for projects to be successful and for, for each stakeholder to be successful, they've really got to collaborate and work together. And if they're doing it, you know, yeah, sort of in silo, you know, with this sophisticated tooling, but they can't collaborate with, with the next party or stakeholder, then I think that's where maybe it's lost and it's not as effective as it could be. Um, but perhaps I know Peter and and and, who, uh, and Malcolm, you guys have both been working quite closely with manufacturers, so you you might be able to challenge me or or otherwise. No, I think you're probably spot on. Uh, same with Peter. The, the machinery and the tooling, uh, it, it, in my experience, it, it just isn't there with with regards to facades to be able to integrate with the bin bottle effectively. Uh, mm. To do that, there'd be a massive up, up, upscale in in, uh, in costs in in replacing manufacturing equipment. Um, at best, most of them are sort of uh, sticking with you know 2D CAD files uh, or hard copy and just doing it manually. So. Uh, to get them into you know, a generic uh, factory situation where the, the, the machinery is, is uh, you know, BIM capable or 3D CAD capable even, um, that, that's, a, that's a big upscale move uh, yeah, that you, you have to take time. It, it couldn't be done uh, any time very quickly. Yeah. yeah, just on top of what Malcolm said, what were we experience? So, for, so, so some of the particular projects, especially is like a curve the run and goes a different like uh, side of a different some kind of leaning in, some kind of leaning out, like a, a typical Zaha building, for example, right? So some of the a cladding factory, aluminium cladding factory, specialized doing all these curves, double curves or triple curves. Mm -hmm. They 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 have to use BIM and they are asked that to the machinery, the computer software, and everything to accommodate for that. But we were talking mm. about straight up curtain wall, like the simple, simple a uh, uh, box, right? What what, yeah. what do they need it? They probably don't need it. They're pretty yeah. happy with what they're doing with 2D like CAD drawings and like every level repetitive, the old square boxes. And they don't really need it. They don't see the benefit. It depends mm. on the uh, what's the future going to be like. What's the building going to be like? Uh, uh, more and more feature buildings with different like sort of geometry that might get more popular. Mm. Yeah, I guess um, uh, you are one of the big ones. I'm not sure if this was something that um, you saw a lot of at Harvey Norman, but uh, one of the trades that we've seen that has moved pretty quickly in this front has been around joinery um, because they can essentially, a lot of the times it's about calculating the um, the sort of volume of the, um, the timber that's needed and then being able to be quite smart with how you actually decide what to cut and what then gets um, assembled together. Um, but for some of these systems, it's similar that even um, the the product will come out the end, but and it will be pre barcoded, which is great. Um, but then if the builder or the supplier um, really needs you to um, have ID'd it in a certain way or packed it in a certain way or, or done some of this stuff, um, there's not that visibility because the ID that is being punched out by the system is going to be completely irrelevant to the um, installer and so on down the track. Um, is that sort of a space where you think there would be value in connecting some of the supply chain data into some of those systems, or do you think that's um, not really that important? No, look, I think, uh, look, I guess some of the projects that we were dealing with um, with uh, with joinery companies was, uh, as I mentioned before, it was offshore, so it was all pre-made. Uh, uh, it was it was it was built uh, from from spec, basically. I guess I guess. Uh, in the last probably 12 months, uh, we've been using a local joinery company, um, and they're, they're, they're basically doing site measures, uh, which makes life a lot easier, uh, especially mm. especially for the joiners and for the builders in particular. Um, where it uh, where previously previous projects we were, we were getting we were getting products on site, and we we had to cut it down by 20, 30 mil, um, mm. or it was too small um so it was just a headache it was just a headache in itself and i think we've just gone away from 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 being that that sort of being in that industry where we just don't want headaches anymore and 
and joinery <laughs> joinery in particular is a headache in, in, in itself uh, because you got to pretty, be pretty much the size. And as builders would say, they they build to to spec, but sometimes they don't. And there's <laughs> there's a few walls that are, there's a few walls out of line there. So, um, but as, as as I mentioned before, like it's if you if you if you're using a local joiner, um, obviously it's going to be more expensive. Um, but uh, if you can go out there and site measure, um, it's a, it makes a hell of a difference. Um, it doesn't really relate to us too much uh, as a, a logistics and transport company um, because basically we, we're, the, we're sort of that middleman where we don't have to worry about that. Uh, our job is to make sure that the product is, 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 uh, is on our trucks um, and we've got the right order and it gets to site correctly. We, all, we, uptake, we uptake all of our product to the rooms and make sure it, it sits in there and doesn't get yeah. damaged uh, by other trades. So, um, but I, I have seen it in the past um and it, yeah it is a, it, it is a it is a bit of a headache mm. yeah um yeah i could i can agree with that from what we said as well definitely um uh so we've just got uh probably only time for one final question from the audience so this was um that 3d printing can be very useful in prefabricated building uh what percentage of construction could be done that way uh in finland most of the buildings are prefabricated um given short outdoor construction window um uh i mean i know actually all of you guys have sort of um been looking at this as well to, to different extents um maybe let's the, the 3d printing front though um is there anyone that has had much sort of exposure or has any sort of views around the um extent to which 3d construction can be used for some of that that oh, sorry 3d printing can be used for some of that um uh, prefab We've only been using 3D in, in the small scale. So uh, looking at uh, interfaces of, of different uh, joints and sections, mm. in particular uh, aluminium sections to, to um, uh, basically finalise die design uh, for fabrication of curtain walls. So uh, yeah, being facades, we're, we're a little, little bit uh, smaller scale than what the, the question was. So it's probably more over to, over to Peter for that one. Uh, yeah, for me, actually, the sign, <laughs> so the sign, we use 3D printing only for the extrusion dies, you're absolutely right. And I mean, for the gasket, it's very small scale. It's not really 3D printing for windows, not not even windows, not even, nah, a small scale. We do yeah. have our prefabricated, like, sort of modular system, but it's not like using 3D printer as, like, proper factory and do it, like, whole lot properly as one-to-one. And one of the that's okay. sorry i was just going to ask curious with the 3d printing is it about the accuracy is that why you're using 3d printing for extrusions uh test method uh, so as i said it might be a difficult interface or a stepped area or you know complex curve design or, or a 3d uh, curve or whatever it might be so um, a quick way to you know, in conjunction with the bim is is to is to 3d print that uh, and uh, have a good look at it and have a play. And it's nothing like being tactile. So, um, you know, it, it works in, in the benefit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes the architect, it just, it doesn't understand drawing. So you, you're showing like a 200 by 100 section, they want to like really touch and feel, right? How big is 100 by 200 section? They want to really physically play around with it. Now it's right, it's just, just for like, for, they want to try, see it physically, not on a 2D drawings. Mm. Yeah, 100%. Um, I actually would be really keen to ask some more questions around this, but I think we're actually up on time. Um, yeah, so thank you guys once again for um, for joining. It's been a, a really fun chat. Um, thanks everyone for listening in. Um, obviously, um, you've got yeah, SIG Global, um, HD Logistics, uh, Hickory Group and uh, Matrack. Um, so yeah, have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of the uh, presentations. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, guys. That's the end of our panel presentation today. Thank you to all of our speakers, and a big thank you as well to everyone who has joined us in the audience today. You will all receive an on-demand copy of today's session via email in the coming days. We hope you enjoyed this webinar. 
Please tune in for the other sessions that are available both live and on demand running from May 31st to June 4th. You can sign up for this via our website if you haven't already done so. That is australiabuild.com. We also host the Sydney Build Expo on November 23rd to 24th at ICC Sydney. It is Australia's largest construction event and features over 300 speakers, and it's completely free to attend. We hope you can see you at one of our future online events or in Sydney. Thank you very much for joining us today.